Hi, I'm Chris Lemaire. I'm a programmer at the American Cinematheque. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our virtual Q&A for the amazing new film called Herself. Uh, tonight, we are thrilled to welcome, welcome uh, director Felita Lloyd, along with the uh, star and co-writer of the film, Claire Dunn. Uh, and the conversation is going to be moderated by Peter de Bruges, who is the chief film critic for Variety. And before we uh, welcome the three of them, I just want to thank Amazon Studios for making this event happen and, of course, providing all six of the uh, films in our week-long Amazon Studios spotlight. So again, thank you to Amazon Studios and thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoy the following conversation. Thanks. Welcome to the American Cinematheque Q&A for Herself. Uh, th this is one of my favorite movies of the year. I'm Peter de Bruges. I'm joined with the director of the film, Philida Lloyd. Uh, you also know her work, at least her screen work uh, from Mamma Mia, The Iron Lady. Uh, Claire Dunn, uh, both Philida and Claire work quite a bit on stage. Claire Dunn, this is really a breakthrough for you. You, you co-wrote and star in the film herself. Uh, tell us where the, as a co-writer, kind of where the origin of this project came for you. Yeah, I was living in New York at the time and I was trying to pilot season as an actress. And I was reading a lot of scripts every day, obviously learning a lot of lines. And then this phone call comes in from a dear friend of mine who's a single mother with three children. And, and she says, oh my God, like I'm being evicted. I have to leave my home sooner than planned, like in about a month's time. And she could not find anywhere to live. So she had to go and declare herself homeless. It's a process you have to do in order to get some temporary accommodation and uh, to keep you going until you get a house. But the problem in Dublin at the moment and back then, five or six years ago, is the same, there's a housing crisis, there is nowhere to go. So people end up living in these temporary accommodation situations, which is usually a bed and breakfast room or a hotel room and for months and months, sometimes years. And it's not a great way to live. So basically my friend had to do that. And I was so angry on her behalf. Um, and I suppose standing there in New York, it was like, I was having a tough time as well with the auditions and kind of going, I don't know if anything's going to happen here. I was at a certain crossroads at a certain point. And I remember just thinking, this is all wrong. Like, this is all wrong. This is all the wrong way around. And I suddenly started fantasizing on her behalf and wishing that she could do a self-build, just like just really cheap and just like bypass the system. So I started Googling self-build Ireland, then added the word cheap. And then found this amazing architect called Dominic Stevens, who built and designed a house for himself for 25,000 euro. And I was like, 25,000 euro? They're spending 40,000 a year per person on keeping them in like temporary accommodation. And you can build a unit for like 25,000, according to this guy. And my mind was blown. And I was suddenly then, I was trying to learn these lines, trying to learn these lines for this audition the next day. And then I was like just about to go to sleep, like turning off the lamp. And it was like, whoosh, this story comes at me. And I was like, a woman decides to build a house for herself. And because she's decided to help herself, it, the right kind of help comes towards her. It's totally outside the usual realms of the norm. She just then has a community form around her and therefore builds a new life for herself. And I knew that she would have to be coming from a horrible situation and I knew even at that moment she's going to be in a domestic violent kind of situation sorry I didn't really articulate that just quite right but basically that should be in a very almost life or death situation for herself and having to leave the home that she's in and having nowhere to go so that would be the the thing and and that was it like I had that flash I had that moment and the next morning after that audition I bought a notebook and you know began uh my journey to becoming a writer and uh, writing that screenplay. And um, it was only as we went on a few years that I got to have the development stage happen with Element in Philida. And then I had the wonderful Malcolm come on board and really, um, yeah, lift it to a new place. I know that you and Philida have worked together on stage. Was that prior to the episode you just described? Did you know each other already or? Yeah, look, I think I was working on the script on my own, just purely on my own during Henry the Fourth when we were film when we were doing that in New York, weren't we? And I remember 
briefly mention it to you and I think I sent you a draft back then and then it was in 2016 when you kind of started to see the lay of the land of your timetable you said to me near the end of it I'm going to direct your movie <laughs> and I was delighted but I think we were working along and um, we were working for years like uh, with this amazing female Shakespeare uh, company um, where the the plays were set in a female prison and we were prisoners then putting on the play and uh, so we were doing that when we weren't in London we were in New York if you know what I mean so it was year after year from 2012 or 11 onwards right through to, to 2016. That you were collaborating with your view. Yeah yeah. Philip, tell, tell us a little bit about uh, sort of like you know your connection with Claire and at what point you sort of learned that uh, she had this other project because it can sometimes be kind of scary to share, uh, it, you know, something that's a little bit um, not yet born with uh, with someone. Yeah, I'm, I mean, Claire, who I already knew to be this sort of remarkable actress and also an incredible musician, um, which you see something of in, in the movie. Um, she she came to me and said that she had written this screenplay and she just wanted me to have a look at it as a friend and I just was immediately blown away by how for a first time writer she somehow had such an instinctive understanding of kind of the proportion of a movie um what could be told um in silence and and what could be told in words and we were working very much with words words was our were our kind of arsenal um but we were very yeah we were working in the criminal justice system we were um very preoccupied by the number of women that had come into um prison from backgrounds of domestic abuse and we were obsessed by somehow putting um, women's voices, getting women's voices that were going unheard kind of out there into the culture and just about kind of injustice. Um, and I guess the other injustice that sort of began to loom as I got more and more involved in the script was the fact that Claire wasn't actually even thinking of insisting that if this film were made, she would play the lead. She had written at that point a small sister character and it was very much the sense was, I've just got to get this thing on and, um, you know, it's too much to hope for that I will also play Sandra, the, you know, the price of that, maybe that we need a, a star to play it. So aside from loving the writing and feeling the subject, it was such an important um, story and I felt like she she knew who Sandra was and was speaking through the writing, not just to kind of those of us who are lucky enough to feel safe in our homes and might be looking out for a Sandra in our world, but actually she was kind of sending a message to Sandra's worldwide saying, um, maybe there's a world out there that it might be ready for you to receive you if, if you can take that step. Um, so as I got more and more passionately excited about it, I just also felt she's got to play, she's got to play Sandra. And somebody one day said, you know, she's written a great role for a, a real leading movie actress. And I was like, did a kind of double take. And I was like, yeah, yeah her, herself. <laughs> I don't know who you think you're talking about, you know, <laughs> um, but um and, and so somehow then we were very lucky to find these great producers, Ed Guiney, Sharon Horgan, Rory Gilmartin. And, and when I said to them, you know, will it make it more difficult to finance the film if Claire plays the lead? They were like, well, it won't make it easier, but let's do it. You know, and, and we had such support from then on um, that you know, that word that, that comes into the film, the mehel, the, the, the ensemble, the, the community that comes together to make something happen. It was very much um, an endeavor like that to, to get Claire's movie um, made and get her heard and seen, you know, to the wider world. Well, it's one of the things I really love about this film is that it feels like kind of a metaphor for itself. And there's such a beautiful way that you have 
dramatized things that are very universal. And um, I mean, just for instance, you, you've explained that, you know, the, the dimension of abuse is not something necessarily that came from your life, but there's an understanding of that in the movie that is chilling for people who've experienced it or, or seen it happen to other people and the way that, you know, it kind of, you, it's so hard to break those connections and in the, in the kind of emotional manipulation that goes on, all these things. You know, so those things have been added dramatically, but behind it all is this, you know, th that uphill battle of telling a story like this and having it be a story of women in a world that is very slowly sort of being shaken into awareness that it's lopsided and it's been badly lopsided, you know, for, for men all along. And uh, I, I can only imagine that there was, uh, you know, that, that speech that is, you know, being given in the courtroom that, you know, that, that somehow also pertains to the way both of you must feel if asked about, uh, you know, what opportunities you've had to fight for in your careers, for instance. And There's no yeah, question. I'm, I'm there, sorry, I don't know if that's a question or <laughs> is it more to Philida or me, but. No, no, I, 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 it's almost sort of like an invitation for the conversation here, but I, I'm curious to yeah. what extent you know, the, um, obviously in the writing of it, it comes from a place of, uh, of your yeah. wanting to break through, but also, you know, feeling very connected to the story, but you must have been uh, intensely aware of the ways in which uh, it echoes its own making. Yes, I mean, I've definitely had contact in my, um, well, more extended family, really, or friends or whatever, just of, of knowing that certain women, and especially in Ireland, it's not really talked about. And it's like, oh, well, you know, they have problems and this thing goes on um, in their house or whatever. And so I kind of, I've not had direct contact with it, but through the women I met, um, who have been through things, but also the books I read. And also definitely my own, um, see the thing I learned by working with Philida and making what we did and doing a breakthrough story was I realized it's not just like, you think you know what the whole thing is about equality and say feminism and all this kind of thing. And then you start to really, really, really start to see very, very, very subtle systemic things that are lopsided that you're saying. And it kind of blows your mind though. You have a huge paradigm shift when you start to go, oh my God. So in my journey of research for this film, I think I, I got very enlightened and and it wasn't necessarily like, uh, you know, black and white, like, you know, um, all men are this or all whatever. And it's very simply laid out. It wasn't at all. It was, it was much more deeper than that. But part of the re in part of the research, when I found out how actually um, abusers, especially with the court system, the court system is leaned one way. I found out a lot of sad stories about how judges would question the victim first and, and certainly question uh, in a very unfair way. It's in a very lopsided way in terms of like, but what did you do to bring that on? It was always like that in Ireland and uh, because it was just lopsided. And then also just how they had to be in the room anyway with them, uh, mm. somebody who had traumatized and, and violently like hurt them. And then the last thing was just the fact that the men, the, the abuser would literally use the children as pawns, but use the system as a weapon itself. And I, it just like the minute you start to see it and see the clarity of it, it's very hard to unsee it. So my um, aim in, in, especially in that court scene, certainly, and throughout the film was to go like, this woman is not a victim. This woman is on a war front. And I read a book where they align uh, victims of abuse, uh, domestic abuse. They literally align it with the experience of uh, the Vietnam soldiers coming back from war mm. and also Holocaust victims. Like it was an unbelievable book that showed what PTSD really is about and healing trauma. And, um, and just kind of once you begin to learn all this stuff and unpeel it, it's like, okay, so like, how do I not ram it over the head of an audience like 
it should be like this. You know, I'm not standing there being moralizing and just like whacking it over the head. How do we make it interesting? How do we break it open in a story world? And how do, how do we give this woman a voice and a moment to just say it? And that was like the, the mission, you know? And it would be exhausting, Peter. Like there'd be days where we'd be like, okay, here we go. She's going into the housing association. And I'd be sweating right in the bloody thing. Cause like, I feel like it's just constant and uphill battle for that woman, for Sandra. And then, but I'm glad we pushed through and we tried to find at least uh, not just a, you know, a document, it's not a documentary and it's not a political rampage. It's a story, but it's yeah, also a story yeah. with a vision of what Go I ahead, wonder what things would be like. I'll stop. It's the fact, it the fact that, that you were speaking, not just to, you know, those of us who will lobby, will lobby for change and are safe and safe in our houses and, um, maybe learned to be different kind of neighbors over this last year or hope we have to be more more alert um, but also it felt as if Claire was literally wanting to send a message to Sandra's all over the world and that somehow mm -hmm. you know if we could get this movie into people's homes um, it was saying we we can hear you know we're out here and we can hear you um, it wasn't just about saying, you know, the situation is so bleak and there really is, you know, it, it's completely bleak. If you're in this situation, you're never going to get out of it. And only if there's systemic change will anything change. Claire was, was speaking um, on another level as well, which, which for me really made it very distinctive. It stood out from this story I'd seen told um, without in any way being a Pollyanna-ish um, notion, you know, that somehow she was the agent of her change and she made that, she brought, she drew that community to her by her will and um, imagination. Well, it, it's an empowerment tale too. So it's, it's almost like it then becomes a kind of example, even though it's an exceptional story and not, retelling, you know, something that someone has specifically done, it becomes something for anyone who finds themselves in one of those many uh, predicaments, whether it's in an abusive relationship, in a, in a housing, you know, uh, system that, that's slow and bureaucratic, all these things. And, uh, and it can be a great motivator. These are the kind of films you know, as stories that, uh, in a way, the world needs to kind of demonstrate what we ourselves are capable of. And she is an, an extremely identifiable character. I love that in one of the very early scenes, you kind of acknowledge this beauty mark that you have and the way that you've incorporated that into the character and into that courtroom scene. Uh, if it's not too personal, would you talk about just how as an actress, you have dealt with that yourself. Yeah, I mean, look, it goes from as early as 12 being told you'll never work in film because of that. And then getting on with it and managing to become an actress myself. Like it just happened and I was working at the, and I had a great time doing that. And I was still getting asked to go for tapes. I still got agents, I still all got it. So I was kind of like, okay, well that was, crap so I kind of was just getting on with my life but then it was like it was that weird synchronicity and weird thing the way the universe works it was kind of like wow I've managed to pick writing a story about a battered woman but my beauty mark happens to look like a black eye so it's just like there was a sort of element of like we just need to clear it up uh mm. there was a bit of a clarity thing that needed to be sorted um but actually it really synced with the mission with with which was always my vision for the beginning of the film was like let's show the universe that Sandra has managed to create for her and her girls this beautiful little safe space of playfulness and her connection as a mother to them let's begin with them let's end with them so I always knew that was going to be there and that we see Gary come in and you know destroy that in a sense and um, and then it was actually Phyllis and, and, and Rose and in BBC and stuff they said uh I wonder is there a way we can just kind of explain it but like weave it in and this kind of thing and then so it sort of came organically at the start like that as in like 
how do you say to your nieces or nephews what you say to them and all and and, and you know we wrote a scene the way I was usually mess and say to my nieces and nephews what it is and so we weave it in as part of the connection with Sandra and her kids but then I think as time went on it was actually Philida and um Malcolm and, and everyone else around me because of course I wanted to forget about it <laughs> they realized then it was actually kind of synced up with Sandra's showing who she truly truly is and owning her true voice in that moment in the courts and that often in my research I discovered that these women would go into the courts and they'd have to put on like a suit jacket or make themselves look presentable and put a load of makeup on and try and and they put it on like a shield and try and face their, you know, abuser and all that kind of thing. And, and so, yeah, so then it kind of got weaved in as like, let's wipe off the makeup and make a part of her standing up there and telling her truth. So it kind of happened organically over the development time, but uh, it definitely didn't come from me at the start. <laughs> Well, it sounds like it didn't even come from you, the idea that you would play this character. So there had to be some... <laughs> <laughs> had to be rectified at some point. Had to, it was kind of a thing. But uh, but Philida can talk more about how it came about in her mind, I suppose. Well, Philida, I'd like to ask you about, you know, to me, this movie reminds me of the last few films of Ken Loach. And stylistically, it's different from your two previous films. You know, it does feel more like a kitchen sink kind of British drama. Uh, and I'm just curious about, uh, you know, the both sometimes those solutions come from challenges, budget, but it's also, you know, a different piece of material from that. I'm curious just kind of like how you found kind of the, 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 the voice of the film, I guess, uh, cinematically. Even the pop songs are an interesting choice, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I'd wanted to do a lower budget uh, movie for a long time. I think that the world that Claire and I were working in in the theatre um, was a very hands-on, um, intimate, uh, democratic uh, environment that we'd built. And I wanted to somehow, and, and we were very, as, as I'd said, sort of kind of driven by the social mission of, of wanting to, um, to tell certain stories about, about injustice in women. And, and so it felt that it was an opportunity for me to somehow bring the two worlds I was working in um, more closely together. And I felt that knowing what Claire was capable of um, on stage and knowing how she identified so entirely with Sandra to the point that I knew that it would be less like covering or, or shooting somebody acting and the very fact that she wasn't you know she hadn't wasn't setting out as a with a vanity project you know this was about sort of all of us bearing witness for women who'd been through this experience and I knew that what her performance would be like on screen and therefore it made me eager to build round her other actors who could do the same thing. And Harriet Walter was working with us and we knew she had, she was incredibly relaxed on camera. She was very used to improvising. Conleth Hill as well had a very similar background to us. Um, and the three of them and myself were able to kind of help the rest of the crew who weren't all professional actors um, we, in a way, the relationship, between, a lot of people have asked, you know, what was the relationship between me and Claire on the set? Well, in fact, in, in many ways, it was the most um, invisible, sort of, that wasn't really what it was about, because we knew what we would do. There was so much kind of shorthand between us, um, that our job was to somehow help create this environment in which the others felt they could improvise or be free to just be themselves um, and so I, I took the lead from her and tried to keep everything very simple and I wanted to keep the camera really close to her and not kind of rupture what was going on with self-conscious maneuvers um, and the music originally when I was temping um, temping a score I'd started off with something 
in a way much more generic, uh, you'd imagine something that kind of gave the whole film a sort of cohesive, haunting, slightly Celtic um, feeling. And then Claire and I went back to some early drafts of, of the screenplay in which she, um, Sandra owned an iPod and music was really important to her. And we started talking about what's on Sandra's iPod and what what's that what was on it and what's she hearing and what are what are those big kind of festival tunes that she and Gary um, she and Gary sort of danced to in the past and and what's what's she hearing that's new and indie and and so it kind of grew out of just uh, yeah that I th and I think it gives the film it, it makes it less it, it's less um, smooth, I guess. It's, it, it has a kind of, you know, you're, you're suddenly thrown into silence and you just, there's no score and you just have to sit with that. And then when, when Sandra gets these escalations of, of a lift from, literally a lift from the community around her, it's as if she, she feels the energy and, and that's where those, some of those, those songs kind of kick in to, to amplify that. Um, because the, the, the screenplay was very much, very full of dark and light um, right from the beginning. Um, the, the tone of it, it had, it had a lot of, lot of contrast. I, I think one of the things that really made this movie special to me and, and sets it apart though from a lot of other films is the the conflict is enormous it's the system and it's the patriarchy and it's you know the, i mean it's marriage as it's unequal and built in society, all these things right but along the way there's this sense that people are coming to her side and every time that happens it just is such a powerful feeling i think for the audience it's there when harriet walter first kind of you know uh offers the land it's there and the uh, you know, in the, the home improvement store where she's, you know, having such an uncomfortable experience with the clerk and the next guy in line calls him out on it. You know, it's there when that guy's son, you know, sort of offers her the pair of shoes. And I just, I just think that's how humans are if given the opportunity. Yeah. This has been a horrible year. We've experienced so much ugliness, but, um, you know, I, like, I found all of those things so plausible and so moving and it, it's a collection of the, you know, the title is herself, but of course that it is this community yeah. that you've described. But, you know, I just want to ask you both just about kind of like, there's a worldview behind this that I don't see in cinema very often, which, because drama is conflict by definition. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was just so touched by an aspect of truth that I don't see being convenient to storytelling so often, which is kindness, you know? Yeah, I'm so glad that you see that it's plausible and true because I witnessed it in my research trips and I felt a huge instinct to include it. And then it became a huge part of the tapestry and it almost became a theme that, so Sandra starts off deciding something different is gonna happen for herself. In order to do that though, Yes, she has to have a spark of bravery and courage and all that and wits about her and, and all that. But she has to be vulnerable again and ask for help. And that's a huge step for somebody in her position to make. But it also made me realize that the best things in human nature and that do happen every day, as you say, is when people just have these small exchanges that can make somebody's day actually. And I witnessed them happen so much especially when i was down in the really dramatic areas of dublin and um, like the courts where you run in to get a barring order when you're when somebody's literally at your door and you're trying to kill you you can get this barring order immediately but you have to go into this place in town and there was all sorts of drama in the foyer there and i witnessed such kindness and such connections happen between people uh same again with other areas i went to research so for me, um, it was a lesson to myself actually. And I went, this is true and I have to include it. And there is a such thing as this being part of a story. So um, so I just know that like, 
and there's a lot of people that might see that and think it's a bit maybe is a Pollyanna or is a Disney and I think if you actually ask yourself how many times even somebody just has a conversation with you at a shop counter there's always an element of human kindness and connection going on if you look for it. Well the way that you said you know Philida you said a couple of times that this is a movie you know for all the Sandras in the world but you know there are we can all be that sideline person who, you know, makes some small or large gesture for someone else. And it becomes a demonstration of that as well. You know, it's like the, I'm not someone who is particularly, I don't know, goopy or sentimental in my, in my personal life. And yet, you know, the, uh, I do feel like a movie like this puts out into the world something essential. And I think that we've been through such sort of existential um, challenge and trauma. We're, we're still in it um, and all questioning our privilege and you know, how safe we are in our homes and other people who, who are not safe in their homes and don't have green space to look out on. And so we're, we are all thinking about our, our place as neighbours and are we being a good enough one and it is a moment to a friend of mine whose whose sister had been through this experience said to me you know it's time to really be nosy neighbours and stop worrying about am I interfering um, because particularly of of what people are going through what you know how much abuse there has been during the pandemic as we know worldwide and because everyone's shut down and so abusers can operate with impunity and so I think you know even our um our prime minister who I'm not going to give too many um plus points to but the other day said you know when they talked about the latest um the latest state of affairs with our lockdown and they, they were he was reading out or speaking what we were and uh, weren't allowed to do and that we're allowed to leave our homes for exercise or if we are running from an abusive situation and I thought gosh that is a I've never heard you know we've never heard that spoken um, by a politician I don't think in this country at a moment like this before. Mm -hmm. It's like the unspoken yeah. war. It's really weird. <laughs> it's like this, like, you know what I mean? It's like a war on the home front that's never talked about properly or more openly. And uh, well, when I saw that announcement, I also just went, oh, step forward. <laughs> it's just wider awareness of it. I mean, it's it, it, if we're talking about the subject of abuse in particular, I mean, it's it's such an insidious thing. And the pandemic has really, I think, it, it, we've heard statistics, but it's, I mean, it's such a trap and this movie addresses that part of that trap is the idea that uh, that in a heterosexual couple, like the woman so often uh, socially depends on the man for support and therefore it's almost like it takes the society itself to 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 believe and and support her in order to make that next step and make that break. And in the pandemic where those systems, feeble as they often are, you know, were themselves kind of being shut down or, or what have you, the kind of uh, groups or the, you know, homes that you could go to for a night or a week if you need to get away from someone, you know, it's like, uh, but, um, but again, I think we, we've talked about this, but I think it's the psychology that you understand of abuse that's, uh, that's so important here, because again, you know, the, there are things that are, that are traumatic that, serve dramatic purposes and you know that is not the way that I think abuse is being handled here it's not just a plot device it is you know no. so, so essential yeah. to the uh, to the aspect of the whole film it's you know it's the the reason that she's leaving and it is because the, our audience has seen the ending maybe we can you know talk about this kind of this horrible thing that happens, you know, at the end, she, you think that, you know, kind of everything has turned out well, and yet that there's that kind of symbolic insidious threat of, uh, 
you know, of her ex um, who can destroy it all at his own whim. Mm -hmm. I, I, the question behind that is, you know, why end the film that way? Because it could have sort of uh, uh, closed before that scene and been a very different feeling. You know, it's, it's a very intense uh, choice. Yeah, I, I'll just quickly answer this because I know Phil uh, probably has their own thoughts, but I went on a journey with writing it and actually the ending hit me. It was almost like a weird, oh God, it has to go this way because I was in a, I think I was in a writer's retreat at the time. It was like four o'clock in the morning and I was wide awake, just like thinking about it all and creating Peggy mostly. And then it was like, um, I, I think I might've been reading some stuff about uh, archetypes and different types of things. And I was really just doing a lot of character building. And then it kind of hit me like, like a, an obvious thing. I was like, oh, um, Sandra is like this planet revolving around a son and the son of Gary. And then he's gone and she needs something else to revolve around. So she revolves around the house. She's like, the house, the house is the answer, the house is the answer, the, house is the answer. And then when one destroys the other, she realizes she has to be the son. So it's kind of like, she, it's about her really learning how to actually accept herself and love herself as well in this journey, because she's somebody that's been so broken down. She doesn't know what pieces of her are left and she doesn't like herself much. And she also can hardly allow people back in. But over the process of letting people over in, in a little bit over the time of building the house and realizing that actually the gift was the journey of building the house and meeting all those people that's what truly the film is about. It's not the house itself. So I, I kind of realize on a very symbolic level, as you say, that like, it can't just be about the house. It has yeah. to be about her journey. And it is the typical Phoenix from the ashes kind of thing, I suppose, by the end. Um, but also it's a film about um, rebuilding and it's about legacy and it's about lots of things. And I needed to be able to, to let go of all the previous things like you have to let go of what was built and start again and it's like and um, I don't know it just it just felt like that was instinctively the right thing to do and show about the older generation of women passing things on as well in the form of Gary's mother for instance and um, so yeah anyway sorry I've waffled on but it was, oh, it was scary by the end of it but I was glad I went that way in the end <laughs> And I'm glad our audience has seen it so that they can appreciate that explanation. Uh, Phil, would you like to, to add anything? No, just that I think that what you feel is this sense that, that the one, one chain of inheritance is broken at the end when Gary's mother um, says, you know, you, you don't have to go back to your one, I do. She is locked in this generations old um, legacy of abuse. But when you see the children um, start to dig and, and, and you know, they're, they're digging and picking through the ashes for the spare leftover screws at the end, you feel a new kind of inheritance has been born and that Sandra has somehow instilled in them, you know, this kind of can do resourcefulness um, and I think that's that's really what it's about. The her everything is is for them. Everything's for the for the children. Well, I mean, if you think about this psychology of abuse aspect, I mean, it's like part of it is that person, the narcissist, the you know the abuser, and it's not always a man, but that's sadly how often it is. And uh, the um, but uh, it's partly about this kind of brainwashing about making the partner feel less and like they can't cutting them off from everybody. And, you know, and that, again, this metaphor sort of is bigger than just abuse, but it is that what you described, Claire, is is so apt in that respect, because if you look and here's where I'm going to sort of do the grand critic evaluation. But like if you look at this as like a social picture, this is a specific example, but a patriarchy and of the way that I think we grow up in a system that tells us to find our places and women have been told that they have a different smaller 
you know, subservient place so often, you know, they as a gender have to kind of relearn this ability to trust love themselves and, and do that. And so that metaphor of the movie is too about, you know, kind of creating your own stories and, and sharing them with the world. And it, it, so it's, you know, abuse can be something that you're sustaining physically in, in one couple, but it's also kind of something that I think we do to ourselves as a culture and we have to yeah. unlearn. I agree. And I think that the part of the journey of the recovery of Sandra is so interesting because you realize that and um, when Gary isn't around, she's great at being crap to herself because she's so learned in having somebody put her down. That's how she functions on herself. So it takes so it's like building new neurological pathways of thinking. And it kind of makes you think like, wow, I wonder, because the lockdown showed me how much we as a society are very concerned about proving our worth uh, by the amount of pro productivity we do, even like just creating stuff, writing stuff, but also, so whenever, when a lot of stuff had to stop, it, it like, honest to God, people did not know what to do. There was then a whole theme of like, at one point where like, oh, well, Shakespeare wrote his, um, <laughs> which one was it? Lear or whatever during, the plague and all, what are you going to do? And it was like, right. I remember just thinking, holy God, like, <laughs> like our sense of pressure that we put on ourselves and, and being sort of a bit self negative. I was like, this needs to stop. Otherwise we're going to forget to just like be a community and build something new together. That's beyond that. That's beyond ourselves. Do you know what I mean? And I think yeah. I really hope, like, ironically, I like, and accidentally, my film is a lot about community, but I really do feel um, that should be a theme for the next, like, few years on the planet. It's just like, my God, we need to kind of get out of our small selves and our banging ourselves on the head selves <laughs> and get behind the bigger sense of ourselves and the helping each other thing I just think like that's a big instinct I have about it so I definitely agree with you I think like the abuser might leave but then the inner abuser needs to also be cleared out as well yeah yeah well I'm so grateful that the that you and the team were able to make this film before you know the the pandemic that it's that now exists to be shared uh that's that's all the time we have for this Q&A but I'm going to turn just to the audience for a second and ask them a question. And that's, who are you going to share this movie with? Because I think we all know people who would really just be transformed by seeing herself. And it's a movie that's uh, just kind of at risk of falling through the cracks. So please share this with your friends and your loved ones and help herself be seen. Thank you all. <laughs>